Praise Jehovah, Lord God Almighty. Praise Jehovah, everlasting King. We praise your name. Praise your name. Jehovah, we praise you. Praise Jehovah. Message entitled Creation Heresy. Mm. My text is familiar. The Gospel according to John, chapter 1, the first four verses, and verse 14. Please read aloud with me the holy text. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The word of the Lord. Creation heresy. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, from our youth, many of us who are serious and true disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ have sung with conviction and enthusiasm the words of the hymn, this is my father's well. And to my listening ears, all nature sings, and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my father's world. I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees, 
of skies and seas, his hand, the wonders wrath. I really love this hymn. I was introduced to it at public school, not church. Times have changed, huh? I was asked to accompany the school on the piano. This great hymn with both its message and melody comes to me with sweet and comforting nostalgia. Yeah. This hymn fittingly introduces the subject of this message. We are involved at this time in a series of messages on the foundations of our faith. Those doctrines upon which everything is built, those truths that are indispensable to all that we stand for. In this study of our faith foundations, we have chosen to be guided by the words of the Apostles' Creed, that ancient affirmation of the Christian faith presented in a concise prayer. Historically, there has been great solidarity across the various denominations of the Christian church concerning the integrity of the content of this creed as a superior summary of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the basic message of biblical Christianity. Creeds, confessions, and catechisms have been historically used as devices for the consolidation of the faith in the hearts of the faithful, for the introduction of the faith to inquirers, for the defense of the faith from infidels, and for the vetting of the faith of new converts. Such devices have become crucial tools for discipleship training in the life of the church. The Apostles' Creed begins with the words, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Will you say those beginning words with me? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. The first two sermons focus on the words, I believe, for the first one, and the words, in God the Father Almighty, for the second one. In tonight's message, we will focus on the words, creator of heaven and earth. We will briefly examine the doctrine of creation with a negative analysis. We use it, the word negative because we are determined to present an abbreviated expose of the primary heretical ideas concerning the created order. We will also attempt to demonstrate the superiority of the biblical doctrine of creation. Obviously, nothing we look at this evening will do more than merely scratch the surface of so great a subject. <laughs> but I am confident that we will still conclude at the end that the effort was worth our time. The biblical teaching about creation is mainly about why God created the world, not how. Are you all following me? When the Bible speaks of this great subject, its emphasis is on why, not how. It is mainly about the meaning of creation, not the method. The biblical doctrine of creation, among other things, shows us how we are supposed to relate to the created world, the created order, the physical world. It also actually shields us from perversions of the worst kind concerning what is often called nature. These verses point us, among other things, to four typical perversions that we should guard against. All right? Let us take them in order. Number one, the heresy of exalted creation. And I base this on verses three and four. There are people who actually worship the creation. Are you all with me? They, they have lifted it up and deified it. They worship the creation. But this is just ridiculous. Why? The verse begins with the words, all things. Mm, mm, mm. All things were made through him. All things. The, the, the created order is made up of things. Quantifiable things. 
All of these things are subject to decay or destruction. There was a time when the things around us, literally everything, did not exist. These things are not essential. These things are not necessary. Nothing is. You're not essential. You're not necessary. I know that insults modern sensibilities because everybody is into the self. The cult of the self reigns. All the shows, all the shrinks, everything, self, 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 self. We really think everything is about us. But we are not essential because we are not eternal. <laughs> All things are derived, derived from another's hand. These things are all finite, not infinite. They're not to be worshipped. These things are not God. Is this clear? The heresy and perversion of paganism um, actually worships the creation. The heresy of, of paganism worships the creation. Paganism is the religion of ancient Europe before Christianity got there. It is the religion of witchcraft. It has other names and it appears on every continent. Even though it's called paganism from Europe. It appears on every continent. It has names like Obia, Voodoo, Occult, Animism. Every ethnic group on the face of the earth has had some historical manifestation of it. It is an attempt to focus on and harness the incredible energies of the natural world. It professes to see the spirit of things like the mountains, <laughs> or the water, or the spirit of the, even the trees. It claims to be able to even tap into that so-called spirit and energy. Paganism makes the physical things of this world into idols. It exalts the creation, celebrating the beauty of the same, for it is beauty that invites worship. Please remember that. Did you hear me? I said, it is what? It's beauty that invites. So if you can't see that the Lord God Almighty is altogether lovely, you're not going to worship him. <laughs> it's beauty. So they look at the beauty of the creation and they start to worship it is when we find someone or something beautiful, considering attributes like power and grandeur and splendor, that we are called to worship. In our call to worship at the beginning of this service, we wanted you to see that the God of the Bible doesn't give up on his children. Oh, come on now. Are you hearing me? He loves you forever. His grace applies to your past, to your present, and even to your future. Uh, you don't have to worry. Yes, you may slip and you may fall, but he is forever committed to you. His covenant is unbreakable. <laughs> now, isn't that beautiful? It's so beautiful, he puts a smile on your face. Because you know that even since he saved you, you messed up. Yeah. And you're worthy to be excluded. But Jesus is still holding on to you. And he will do so all the way to glory. <laughs> the reason why you smile when you hear that is because it, he's beautiful. Isn't, uh, that's, that's just beautiful. When you get it, all of his attributes, it invites you to worship. <laughs> If the God of the Bible is not the ultimate beauty to you, if you know nothing of his glorious attributes, you will not worship him. You will have fake worship. Romans chapter 1 advises that this idolatry is inevitable when we ignore the obvious revelation of the true and living God. It explains that idolatry is born when we have, quote, exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And worship and serve the creature 
rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. That's Romans 1 25. When we do not look behind the created thing to the creator, our hearts will rest in the created thing in our quest for ultimate beauty. In other words, we, 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 we will take a look at certain things that are obviously created things, and, 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 and we will have pleasure in our involvement with the same, pretending that the beauty that we have encountered is ultimate, because it's pretend we have to pretend that it's ultimate. And even as we give to a finite thing the same pleasure that we should be giving to the infinite one, we actually get immersed in idolatry. Please do not misunderstand what is happening when we exalt the creation in worship. Don't misunderstand what is going on. Um, it is not that there is a false beauty in the creation. Come on, man. Are you all still with me? Yeah. When you get into idolatry and you're worshiping the creation, it's not because there's a false beauty in the creation. The beauty in the world is real. It's real. It is so compelling that even after the introduction of sin, though diminished by the advent of evil, it still manifests the splendor of its author. Can you imagine what you used to look like before sin then? If it's still so beautiful. <laughs> the beauty that we see in the world is real. We, we become confused because we often do not see that the beauty is not in the physical things, but through them. Oh, you didn't even hear what I said a while ago. <laughs> I said, when you look around and you see the beauty, the beauty is not in the thing. The beauty is through the thing. I say, what are you talking about? The beauty is really from God. Yes, that's it, that's it. The world can only reflect his beauty. Sin confuses us. We imagine that the beauty is intrinsic to the thing. That the beauty is innate with the thing. We don't understand that it's God make it beautiful. This is why our hearts are broken every time. For without the true and living God, the beauty cannot be sustained or maintained. Oh my goodness, man. You see, you see, sin is what makes us ugly. Sin is what destroys us, spoils everything. So when you see something beautiful in this world, just know it's, it's the beauty of the Lord that's, that's coming through. But the minute the, the, the spoiler comes, <laughs> the ugliness will come through because the beauty isn't intrinsic. <laughs> the beauty comes from God. Our idols will always break our hearts because the ultimate life is not in them. Verse 4 of our text tells us that in him our creator was life. He created the world, but in him was life. In him was light. <laughs> you see, we need to pray for the grace to see the true source of all beauty. God is the original. Uh, somebody say that out loud. Will somebody say that? God is the original. The creation is but a finite reflection. It is he alone who is altogether lovely and worthy to be praised. Yes, he shines in all nature as all nature sings and round us rings the music of the spheres. Yes, his beauty shines in rocks and trees and skies and seas. Yes, his beauty shines in the morning light and the lily white. Yes, his beauty shines in the rustling grass as we hear him pass. But there came a time when this natural beauty was eclipsed by a more compelling display of his majesty. This was when the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We, we now see that the creation pales in comparison to the beauty of the creator. Now, what we see is the desire of nations. Yeah. What we see is the rose of Sharon. What we see is the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. What we see is the fairest of 10,000 to our souls. Somebody ought to give him what he deserves. The heresy of exalted creation. Secondly, 
the heresy of erratic creation. I'm basing this on verse 3. The heresy of erratic creation. Now it is abundantly clear in verse 3 that all things were made. You didn't see that. All things what? Were made. They were designed. Mm. They were not accidents. They were deliberately fashioned and intelligently conceived. Are are y'all hearing what I'm saying to you here? The heresy of secularism teaches the opposite of this. It teaches that what we call the created order is here by accident. Did you hear me? (laughs) This is what evolution is based on. Everything just happened. Matter creates itself. Hmm? It just happened. (laughs) Self-creation is an absurdity because to create yourself, you have to exist before you exist to create yourself. You all know about that. So this matter, this this, this whole business of, of accidental creation teaches that what is true about us is only the result of natural selection. That it is only the result of blind forces, just accident. However, there's a huge problem here. Because the very same people who say they believe in evolution want to say they believe in justice. But the two are mutually exclusive. Are, are y'all still with me? Are y'all still with me? It's a big, big problem here. You see, every falsehood has unintended consequences. Big, big problem here if we are not created by design. If we believe that we are here by accident, then there is absolutely no way in the world that we must ever talk about right and wrong, about anyone. If you believe that we are here by accident, you can't say anything is right or anything is wrong or anybody is good or anybody is evil. Even when we talk about figures like Hitler and Stalin and Pol Pot, and Mao Zedong. <laughs> we will never be able to accuse anyone of wrongdoing. We will never be able to talk about justice and injustice. Why? Why? Well, think about it. There will be no such thing as a good person or a bad person if we're here by accident. Accidental creation of necessity erases the concept of good, even in the abstract. The reason for this is that goodness and badness are meaningless when we attempt to discuss them apart from consideration of purpose. Oh, no, you didn't even hear that. If you're not going to talk about purpose, you can't get to goodness and, and badness. You can't get to that. Okay. How do I know if the car that I drive is a good car? Man, you, 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 you. How do I know it's a good car? It's, it is impossible for me to answer this question without first of all establishing what a car is there for. What is the purpose of a car? Are you all still with me? If you don't know what the purpose of a car is, you can't decide on if it's a good car. <laughs> purpose comes before value. Come on. Are y'all hearing me? You see, today's cars are not made to fly. It's not the purpose. Our cars were not designed to leave the ground. Are are y'all with me? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Neither is the average car designed to float. Even though we in a flood emergency would wish for some semblance of buoyancy, We will, in most cases, be disappointed. (laughs) Boy, sometimes I watch these videos online of people who drive off a bridge or run into some flooded area, and I'm amazed how quickly the car fills up. Aren't aren't you? (laughs) How quickly that the car will fill up with water. (laughs) Listen to me, folks. Frankly, we should not expect these things from our cars because the purpose is clear. To discuss the value of anything apart from a discussion of its purpose is an act of futility. It is meaningless talk. Accidental creation or chance creation means that there is no author. If it happened by accident, there is no author. Hmm? There is no one who can claim copyright privileges. There is no one who could claim property rights. Are you all hearing me? 
If there is no author, then there is no authority. Same word, you know. Same root. I said, if there is no author, then there is no what? You see, because the author of something is the, the authority on the thing. It's the one who decides how the thing should go. Huh? You build your house with your own funds. You don't like something. You break it down. Nobody can argue with you. Why? You're the, you're the authority. That is why God introduced himself to Moses as, I am that I am. And he didn't give an explanation. Because he's not derived. He's the only essential being. Everything comes from him. So he doesn't need to give explanations. If somebody walk in your yard and say, get out of here. Your yard. You are the title deed. Your yard. And they say, get out of here. Now, are you going to run inside and find your title deed? No, man, you're going for, you're going for something else. <laughs> the fire truck. <laughs> you're going for something What a joke, at all. Listen, please understand what I'm saying to you. When, when you are on your turf, when you are the authority, you don't give explanations. You say, oh, really? Hold a second there. <laughs> uh, um, you, you, when God stepped on the scene and Moses wanted to know what his name was, he says, I am that I am. Tell them I am sent you. Did he explain? No, he didn't. Because when he gets past, present or future he's always in the present tense oh, Lord. if there is no author then there is no what no authority if there is no authority there is no prescribed purpose come on we are therefore free to do as we please with whatever has been created come on now huh there are things that, in terms of intellectual property, that are public domain. You do what you like with them, nobody will trouble you. A lot of the great hymns that we sing, these are public domain hymns. It's intellectual material and the author is written on it, but it's public domain because they want everybody to use it freely. Are you understanding me? But other things with that little copyright symbol on them, other songs, or other books or whatever, please don't do what you like with them. Somebody can sue you. Because the author is the authority. Are, are, are you all hearing what I'm saying to you? Are you, are you? You understand how this works now? So now if there is no author, you can do what you like. People are doing as they like because they are convinced or they have convinced themselves that there is no author. So if there is no author, there is no authority. Do I like? There goes our laws concerning intellectual property or every school's prohibition of plagiarism. Let's get personal with this. How do we know that we are good people? How do we know that anyone is a good person? If people arrive on this planet by chance or by accident, if the planet and the universe came into being by accident, if the same has no prescribed purpose due to the absence of any authority, which is the place of the creator, if we were made for no particular purpose, there is absolutely no way that we could ever look at anybody and say, what you have just done is bad, that's wrong. Because nothing is bad now. Because no author there, no authority, no People will do what is right in what? In their own eyes. Because if it's accident and no authority is there, no author is there, you can't say they're wrong. But the very people who say they believe in evolution and accidental creation huh, are the people who are saying, we want justice. <laughs> you can't have it both ways. If we're here by accident, no law there. Laws would become arbitrary constructions. Oh, are y'all hearing what I'm saying to you? Listen, folks, if we are all here by accident, if we were not created by deliberate design, then secularism is correct. And any talk of morality or 
ethics is over, completely gone. Individual rights will be non-existent. All codified systems of morality would just become arbitrary. We would have to just forget about civil rights or constitutional rights. These would be based on nothing but brute power and arbitrary consensus. Mob rule. Uh, we need the deduction of creation. For without it, there is no purpose in life. We were made. How, how many understand we were made? We were designed. Because we were designed, there is an author. Who is the authority? He is the one who has established right and wrong in accordance with the purpose that he has built into the things that he has created. Freedom for created beings always comes with qualifications and limitations. You hear me now? When you are created being, your freedom comes with qualifications and limitations. Only the creator has absolute freedom. So, so, so get the notion of absolute freedom out of your mind. Only the creator has that. Those with a derived freedom who, who live in submission to the creator will welcome the limits to their freedom. Are you hearing what I'm saying? They will look at God's laws and they say, these laws are good. They're good for me. As a matter of fact, these limits are what keep me free. Mm -mm. They see the limitations as protecting their freedom. We lose our freedom when we despise its limits. Oh, that's something that you need to remember, you know. I said we lose our freedom when we do what? When we despise its limits. Consider for a moment what a free dolphin is. We've seen them jumping out of the water. They are amazingly intelligent creatures. <laughs> Amazing. Bright, bright animals. It is a mammal, but it's designed for water. Come on now. It loses its freedom when it disobeys its purpose and leaps out of the water onto dry land. Oh, come on, man. <laughs> you heard that? It loses its freedom when it rebels against its limits. Uh, uh, come on, come on now. Y'all understanding freedom better now? On the land, it cannot move freely and look about meeting its needs. How is it going to hunt when it can't move? Hmm? If it cannot return to the water, because that's what repentance is. Return to your limits. Come on now. Huh? Huh? If it cannot return to the water, it will be perish it's, it's that simple except you repent you shall all likewise perish. you have to return to your limits if you want to enjoy your freedom <laughs> in like manner we will only know the liberty of obedience when we find the purpose for which we were created and conscientiously and consciously embrace it okay I am happy to know that my existence is not the result of random and erratic forces. Anybody else? Yes, 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 yes. Huh? Come on, come on, come on, man. When, when God chose me, it wasn't any mini mine anymore. No, sir. No, he, he locked into me even before my conception. Yes, oh, you, you didn't even hear what I'm saying. Say. He wanted me. Oh, my heart rejoices in the fact that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Psalm 139 verse 4. You see, I can live with confidence and faith for even in the midst of my problems, I know that I was planned for. Anybody glad about that? I said, I know I was planned for. Even before the foundation of the world, I was planned for. Even when I was in Adam, my federal head, I was planned for. Even before I was fashioned in my mother's womb, I was planned for. Even after I displayed my depravity in sin, guess what? I was planned for. Even when he brought me out of the miry clay and set my feet on the rock to stay, guess what? I I was planned for even as he orders my steps in his way I was planned for even as he prepares a place for me in glory and will come again to receive me unto himself hallelujah to the lamb I was in God's plan
We have the heresy of what? Ex exalted creation. The heresy of what? Erratic creation. The third one is the heresy of excretable creation. I'm looking at verse 14. <laughs> you already see from the root of the word what we're talking about. Hmm? Hmm? There are many who speak disparagingly of the created order. <laughs> they see the physical world as inherently sinful. Hmm. Even as they mock and slander the work of God's hands. <laughs> However, we know that the analysis cannot be true. Why? Why do we know that the physical world is not evil? Well, please note that the first part of verse 14 makes it clear that God got physical. Okay. My, you didn't hear. <laughs> the word was what? Yes. Become flesh and did what? And to other most, God got physical. <laughs> the word, the incarnate God, the second person of the blessed trinity, got physical. Obviously, the physical cannot be bad then. Because God is light. And in him, there is no darkness at all. At all. So if God is involved in it, he can't be wrong. Are you all hearing what I'm saying to you? Yes, yes. Now, this is a very shocking heresy of men. That the creation is fundamentally evil. That the physical world is inherently sinful. That the attainment to the non-material or the spirit, as they say, is the ultimate good. Now, this is how the heresy of legalism was born. Hmm? Legalism. The Greco-Roman philosophies, the Greco-Roman religions and worldview basically taught that the spirit is good and the body is bad. The body was considered to be the prison house of the soul. The body bad. The body keeping down the soul. <laughs> Thus, in their paradigm, the enjoyment of our bodies, taking pleasure in anything physical, only imperils our soul. So to be holy, you can't get physical. I y'all <laughs> You follow this, you know. This way of thinking is always suspicious of any physical pleasure. If anyone is having a good time, this paradigm concludes that somebody must be sinning. You know, there are actually people in the world today who are so holy, if you laugh, they're vexed. In any kind of fun, some sin must be going on. Mm. <laughs> Um, for this kind of thinking, a perverted self-denial becomes very important. What kind of self-denial? It's a perverted self-denial. To achieve the ultimate good, we are advised by this heresy that we must embrace asceticism of some kind. We must punish our bodies in self-denial. We are encouraged by this heresy to pummel the body if we are going to have spiritual enlightenment and illumination. <laughs> this view, of course, has clearly influenced the church. It's a part of our church history. That is why in church history, things came into being that were called monasteries and convents. Oh, come on now. Huh? It appears to have a confusing ring of truth to it. It appears so because it's self-denial. But it is really deadly and unbiblical. The self-denial required by Christ, like where? Luke 9, 23, where Jesus said what? If any man desires to come after me, let him do what? Deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. In other words, self-denial and even a cross of suffering is involved. Huh? So now, that is self-denial. But I want to make it clear that the self-denial required by Christ is not the same as this wicked asceticism. Christ calls us to deny ourselves of sin. And sin is defined as any violation or transgression of his commandments, according to 1 John 3, 4. Hmm? Sin is what? What is sin? The transgression of the law. Sin is lawlessness. Hmm? 
On the other hand, the legalistic, this legalistic heresy is a call for us to deny ourselves legitimate physical pleasures. <laughs> you understand? Not sin. This, the, 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 the pleasures for them are evil. <laughs> now, there can be a sinful indulgence in pleasure. But they're not getting into that. And so, uh, so anything uh, that is pleasurable, they look down upon it. So it's not fornication they look down on. They look down on sex. Are you all still with yes, me? Yes, yes, yes. Huh? <laughs> so our sexuality, our food, our sports, our entertainment, they look down on any, any kind of pleasure is sinful. We are advised to do this simply because of the warped view that the physical is evil. This is basically legalism. It loves restrictions. This legalistic self-denial is not just a means to an end. It is an end in itself. Adherence to this perspective believe that denying themselves of physical pleasure is virtuous. <laughs> you know, it is so sad that many professing Christians have bought into this nonsense. Are you all hearing me? They embrace the fallacious and ridiculous notion that if something makes us miserable then it must be good for us. You know, like sulfur bitters or Epsom salts. Lord help me. The young people in them look blank, blank. Anybody know what I'm talking about here? There was a time in Antigua and Barbuda, every household having sulfur bitters and Epsom salts. Lord have mercy. <laughs> anyway, let's not, get, let's not get into that. <laughs> so they figure if it's making you miserable, it's good for you. <laughs> they erroneously imagine that something must be the will of God if it hurts. We must be the will of God if it's difficult, if it's unpleasant, if it's painful. <laughs> in other words, in this warped way of thinking, it is the agonizing and arduous experiences of a thing that validates its spiritual value and efficacy. So, this perspective reasons that if something does not have an obvious downside, it cannot be the will of God. The things of God are associated with that which is unpleasant. By the way, this is the very reason that many people are suspicious of religion. They figure that the minute they get involved in that, that's the ultimate fun killer. So please, please do not describe the faith with this ascetic heresy. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Listen, folks, the opposite is true with the God of the Bible. Did you hear me? From the very beginning in the book of Genesis, we see a God who embraces the physical. The work of his hands as creator in all things. Our God literally got his hands in the dirt in the creation of man and walking in the garden. Later, there are so many theophanies that appear throughout the Old Testament where God got physical. Ultimately, of course, God sends his only begotten son. And this is the importance of verse 14 of our text. The physical cannot be bad if God got physical. The word became flesh. The, the Lord, our God, was so committed to the goodness of his creation that he entered it. Wow. Come on, man. He continually works to redeem it. He promises to restore the paradise that has been lost. It is, it is only biblical Christianity that has a permanent physical paradise in its promises about the future. I said, you didn't hear what I said about Ghana. It's only biblical Christianity that has what? A permanent physical paradise in the future. <laughs> the physical creation is not inherently evil. The future paradise, I'm talking about the eternal kingdom of God. The Christian's hope, described in Holy Scripture, is very tangible and palpable. It will be physical. Listen to me. We are going to run and not be weary. <laughs> we're, we're not going to float, by the way. Get about that. that that's not it. <laughs> we're going to dance. We're going to hug one another in the eternal kingdom of God. We're going to eat, too. You see? <laughs> Oh my goodness, we got a little preview of that, you know. Please remember that the resurrected Christ in his glorified body actually had some fish. Read Luke chapter 24, verse 42 and 43. 
Oh, I'm looking forward to seeing that eternal kingdom of our God. It is written in Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had what? passed away. Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God shall wipe away all all tears from their eyes there shall be no more death no sorrow nor crying there shall be no more pain for the form of things are passed away hallelujah that's a heresy talking about the creation is bad so we have the heresy of exalted creation the heresy of what erotic creation, the heresy of what? Excretable creation. Finally, the heresy of escapist creation. I'm still in verse 14. The heresy of what? Escapist, escapist creation. Boy, I got my fourth E. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hmm. Now, there are people who actually believe that the world around us is actually not real. They are escapists. Come on now. Now, that might, you're Christian, so that, that is going to sound ridiculous to you. But there are millions of people in this world who believe that the created order is not real. <laughs> Verse 14 of our text gives us a complete rejection of the heresy of pantheism, which includes the notion that the creation as we know it is really an illusion. <laughs> we are told categorically in the text that we beheld his glory. Yes, yes. Come on now. Mm. That the emergence of this God incarnate, God in the flesh, was empirically verified. Oh my goodness. We beheld it. Witnesses saw him. Now this notion that the creation is an illusion, is from the Eastern religions. The Buddhism and the Hinduism and so on. Hmm? Well, then why are we talking about this? We must address it because Eastern religions have for some time been gaining traction in the West. And you know the enemy of your soul has some subtle ways of getting into your life. Hmm? Many people are enamored with the meditative exercises of Hinduism. Things like yoga. Not realizing that it is extracted from the worship of a false god. Many are attracted to the mysticism. Hmm? To the eclectic nature of Eastern theology and philosophy, you know, because it's dabbling in every little thing. Now, if the created order is really an illusion, if there is essentially no creation, if the physical world and all the laws of the physical world are basically an illusion, if we are all a part of everything and everything is a divine unit, if the whole creation is God and there is no personal God, then salvation in their thinking is found in escaping and overcoming and transcending the illusion of the physical. Mm. In our postmodern times, these ideas have gained traction in the passion for eclecticism and seeing all points of view as being equally valid. Yeah. You know, there are people who think, well, listen, man, everybody's right. Mm. Mm? <laughs> you, you know how you could find out immediately that that statement is nonsense, that everybody is right? Huh? Because they will say, you are wrong to say everybody is not right. Well, if everybody's right, how am I wrong? Let, let me tell you something. Sin makes you stupid, you know. Sin makes you stupid. <laughs> anyway, pantheistic religions are becoming more and more attractive to many people. The problems around us, according to this view, that have manifested themselves in a physical reality, are not actually there. <laughs> That's what they say. They're not actually. Thus, we should not trust what we see. 
Therefore, with some semblance of mental manipulation, we are told that we can transcend all that is a negative physical reality. If we can only penetrate the illusion, we can evade whatever we find threatening. So the idea is that we can create our own reality. We are told that we might as well do so for what we're seeing with our two eyes is really fake. Those who don't want to face a real God with a real creation will find these ridiculous ideas to be attractive. On the other hand, the biblical doctrine of creation is that creation around us is very real. Verse 1 of our text begins with the words, In the beginning. Which means that there was a time when the creation was not. The text does not refer to the beginning of God. For the God of the Bible has no beginning. For he is eternally self-sufficient and dependent on nothing or no one. It is he who has brought the creation into being. All things were made by him alone. There was a time when the things that we see were not. Then verse 3 tells us that he acted. He brought all things into reality. He alone is God. So we delude ourselves when we imagine that we can create our own reality. For such pantheistic heresy, by its own definition, would be an illusion. <laughs> you know, I learned in apologetics class a long time ago that you test an epistemology by itself. If you can't pass its own test, you know it's absurd. This heresy calls us to put our heads in the sand. Let's not describe how that looks. But it calls us to put our heads in the sand. It, it, it trades on hopelessness and ends in fantasy. But there's a better way. How many glad there's a better way? <laughs> I said there's a better way. The better way is to face reality. The reality of the creator. The reality of a creation that is good. The reality of sin that has spoiled everything. The reality of a savior who will fix everything. The reality of a hope that's steadfast and sure. See, I have no time for pretending, for hell is real and permanent. I have no time for pretending for God is holy and just. I have no time for pretending for many are suffering and dying. I have no time for pretending for time is better spent facing reality. The reality of sin and suffering, the reality of the Savior, and the reality of salvation by faith. Um, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, I'm coming to the close. We have seen Four heresies concerning the created order. The God of the Bible is so committed to the creation of his hands that he sent his only begotten son to be a part of it. And he has promised to restore it at the second advent. That which has been broken by sin will be mended by grace. <laughs> Thank God! His image in man, though the face has not been erased. God's redemptive plans will unfold a glorious and permanent reality that will outshine the original Garden of Eden. <laughs> you think that was beautiful? <laughs> what he has in store for us. Oh, that will be glory for me. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> it is just not enough for us to affirm, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You see, we will never truly be committed to the biblical doctrine of creation unless we also understand just how much the creator is committed to us. You didn't hear me. I said we will never be truly committed to the biblical doctrine of creation until and unless we understand just how much the creator is committed to us. Just think for a moment about what it cost the Lord God for him to take, take us, the creative work of his hands, in spite of our rebellion. And do something about our sin and our brokenness. The question before us right now is this. Have we truly embraced the Lord Jesus Christ into our lives as our creator? Have we embraced him as what? Our creator. You see, it is one thing to say, I believe he is my savior. 
is quite another thing to understand the full ramifications of the doctrine of creation. You see, when we, when we really embrace him as our creator, it will be clear uh, that, that we truly comprehend the magnanimity of his grace as our savior. Oh, you didn't hear me. <laughs> you see, his saving work is diminished if he's not appreciated as our creator. You have to deal with the fact that he's your creator first. So let us be clear about this. As creator, he owns us. As creator, he defines us. As creator, he directs us. As creator, he demands worship from us. As creator, he demands service from us. As creator, he judges us. As creator, he can legitimately destroy us. As creator, he is never accountable to us. Okay, we got that clear? If we have that clear, we can now be sober about our status and consider the magnanimity of his extravagant grace, his extravagant mercy, love, and forbearance concerning us. See, now that we know that, as our savior, he vicariously lives the life for us that we should have lived. As our savior, he vicariously died the death for us that we should have died. As our savior, he's our advocate with the father. He's the righteous one. As our savior, he ever lives to make intercession for us. As our savior, he continues to prepare for the consummation of our joy. As our savior, he will triumphantly return to usher in our blessed hope. As our savior, he will complete the restoration of our world. Paradise lost will be paradise regained. That's why I believe in God the Father, creator of heaven and earth. Amen.